This is the beginning of the REU's final symposium. It's going to be a two-day event, and I'm psyched to see all of you guys here. Um, this is our 12th year of our program, and this is the first time we've done a remote program. And so it's been a, a little strange in kind of how we do the delivery, and um, but I think it foreshadows a bit of the future here for the next little bit. Um, so this is the 12th year of the program, and really by all measures, this program has been wildly successful, this year also included. And I think you're in for a pretty exciting uh, two days of seminars. Uh, they're each gonna be about a two, two and a half hour kind of day. Um, just for some housekeeping, um, this is gonna be recorded, and that record would, can become available. I think we'll post it onto the Bigelow site. Um, we went, uh, uh, paperless this year and we have an abstract booklet and inside the chat of the uh, of the zoom I think we have a link that's posted there and you can click on that and get a hold of this program and you can download it um, you're all muted and the videos are turned off and this is just to protect everybody from a zoom bombing or something like that uh, and if you have questions you'll be able to type them into the zoom box but the way that we're into the chat box but the way that we're going to handle this is that the students will get the first opportunity and so the audience will also see kind of how a science uh, seminar goes you know when when we all go to a meeting to present our data and how these questions and answers are are uh, often dealt with um, each student will have about 15 minutes uh, total for their talks so their talks will often go around 12 and then they'll give us just a couple of minutes of, or have a couple of minutes of, <clears throat> excuse me, of questions. Um, so this, uh, can you guys see my pointer? And so people, that's how people will also walk you through some of their slides today. Um, the, this program is funded by a whole bunch of different federal agencies. Um, I just, from the start, thank them for all the support that they've given this program over the years. Um, and internally, it takes a ton of people in the background to work these things. I mean, there are coordinators, like all of you know, Roxana, who dealt with all the applications coming in and, and working through all of that. Nicole Poulton is also a big part of this. IT, particularly in this particular setting, um, Kevin Gay has just been crazy great. Um, most important is these mentors, because each one of these students went within a particular mentor's lab. And while the students had a paid internship, the mentors do this as service and should be acknowledged, that happens. Um, there's a lot of professional work that went in this, and I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of just kind of how the program was set up. But those people that were involved with some of the background professional work were Nick Record, uh, Kath Mitchell, Abby Tyrell, um, Maura Nimisto, Rachel, and I think she's on here. Yep, Rachel Kaplan, and Barney Balch gave a, a seminar in this piece. And then the funders are, are shown here. So the REU program uh, takes students from all over the country. They have to be, the only criteria is they have to be a US citizen, and they have to be in a school at that time. And this is kind of where all of our students came from this year. Um, it was a first timer that we have somebody from Alaska that's in this, and we covered the Eastern Seaboard, a couple of the states in the in the Midwest, and along the Eastern and Southern Coast. Um, and if you, we had 17 science interns this summer, and you superimpose that on the life of the program, and we've covered a lot of ground now from Alaska all the way down to Puerto Rico. We have people in California all the way up to the state of Maine. We've done about 160 interns over the years. And um, with over that, we've funded about $750,000 worth of stipends. We've done uh, room and board over the years. And often we fly students in and out and, and uh, those kind of costs. It's really, a, uh, it's really a great program. I can't say enough about um, the thanks I have to the federal government for supporting this thing. Um, but that's not really the measure of the success of these programs. The measure of the success of these programs are how the students do during these things. And so over the years, so here are the three funding cycles that we've had. We've just started a fourth funding cycle this year, and it's a, again a three-year supplement. But we've had 94 students go to meetings over this period, so we brought them to major international meetings. We've had 24 publications come out of these 
over the uh, 12 years that this program has been going on, which is extraordinary against all measures of, of REU programs. And they've been on 14 cruises. And these are cruises, not day cruises. These are cruises that last usually over two weeks. So we pull students back and they often go, we've had students go on cruises as part of the REU program. So there's, there's opportunity in there for, for those kind of experiences. So this is our first REU program that's been online. This is what I saw every day. I have no idea how tall these students really are, but it's a fabulous group. And I love, I love this, this image because we've had dinners like this. We've had all kinds of professional development, things like this. There've been a lot of activity, but it all looks like this. You know, every, every single one of them. So the program involves these individual science projects, and that includes ROR's. And these ROR's are these round tables, and it was an opportunity for students to present to each other. So it's a learning opportunity, both how to present, but it's also a learning opportunity that when somebody's learning about their project, they teach it to each other. So we got to walk through kind of this learning experience as they, through their eyes, as they were experiencing it. Um, there's also professional development, and these included some coding, they had a coding hour every Friday. They had a journal club. They had science communication. Um, they did a, a marine navigation uh, seminar early on. Uh, they had an Excel primer and they also had stats. And this is embedded in that while they're doing their individual projects. They also attended science seminars that we had or that we could tune into from, from other folks, from other institutions that are also doing this stuff online. So there was a lot of exposure to the outside community during this process. They did a diversity and inclusivity workshop. And, you know, it's interesting, it's not just the pandemic that we were dealing with, but we're also dealing with a civil upheaval. And there's a lot of discussion that if we would have been able to have just in the hallway or, or sitting around over lunch. And this was a way to just touch on that while this process was happening. And then we had a little bit of a round table to grad school and we certainly didn't get through everything, but it opens the door so that they know there's a friendly face out there and people that they can reach out to if, as they go through this process. But what you're gonna hear about today is the science part. So this is an individual science project that they do. It's a 10 week kind of immersion, although doing it online is a little bit different. But what every student did was they designed experiments, they looked at data or collected data in some way, they also analyze their data. They have to interpret it. You're gonna hear that interpretation of what, what they did today. There were deliverables through all of these, these milestones just to keep us all on track. So they wrote a proposal, a three page proposal that put together their idea for what the summer was gonna look like. Um, they presented their data to these other students. That's what we call these round tables on research, these ROR's. Um, and they also did a poster. And this is what we will bring to a, a meeting and, and those posters can be updated until probably January when, when we'll start to think about which meeting we're gonna to try to attend. And then uh, the final presentation, which is what you're gonna to see today. So that science that you're gonna to see today covers all aspects of, of things that we do here at the lab. Um, you're gonna see stuff on new phyla that people are talking about uh, bacteria on phytoplankton, on metazoans, including zooplankton, birds, whales, kelp. Um, they collected data from the field. There are students that actually, one student got to come to the lab to collect data. Other students got um, raw data sent to them and had to go through it. Other ones went through the literature to try to clear out data. I mean, there were lots of ways that we tried to poke at this, this internship. Um, in all cases, I really think that the students got their hands on some sort of data sets and had to put their own personal spin and understanding of it. The work is, uh, looks at physiology, genetics. They analyze time series to address questions about the ecological, physiological, and, and just the distribution patterns of, of organisms out there in the ocean. So the way this is gonna work is each student is gonna, or we're gonna open it up. Each student is gonna just introduce themselves and then walk us through their talk. The first questions, again, are gonna be up to the students and they'll ask it of each other. 
And then if you guys want to ask a specific question, you can type it into the text box and uh, I'll try to triage and ask if there's a question in there or I'll ask a question myself. Um, and that's it. I think Benji's gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing. And Benji is gonna load up his file. And each of these will have 15 minutes. Um, some of the time, ooh, let me see if I can do this. Um, the, let's see if I can, I'm not sure in this format how I get to add my thumbs up, but I'm gonna to try to provide a thumbs up on the side of my screen that'll warn when we're at 14 minutes and then we'll try to just wrap it up so the audience can understand kind of what's happening in there. And that's it. In a minute, Benji, sit uncomfortably for one minute. <laughs> and then, okay, and then we'll start it. And let me see if I can't shut down. Uh, let me just add one last thing since we have a minute. We get 260 applications for this program and we accepted 17. So what you're looking at are a bunch of rock stars and they're really, they're really a fabulous group of students. Just wanted to make that plug. <laughs> and I will mute myself. Wait a tiny bit longer. Whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Benji Brownberg. I am a rising junior at Lewis and Clark College. And this summer, I worked with Dr. Jose Antonio Fernandez Robledo to synthesize previous IPSC research to, gener to create a framework to generate an IPSC line for Crucial Strata Virginica. Um, here we go. Okay. Uh, to accelerate research on oyster disease, cell development, and shell formation, it's highly beneficial for researchers in the industry to generate uh, an immortalized cell line for Persistoria virginica, which is the most farmed oyster species in Maine. As you can see here on this timeline, uh, there have been frequent attempts to establish cell lines or bivalves in the past uh, 20 years, um, but none have successfully accomplished that task. So establishing a cell line for oysters would be a huge breakthrough because uh, for molluscan and bivalve research, because there's currently only one cell line, which is the freshwater snail Biomophilaria glabrata. And currently no lab has ever seen oyster cells proliferating. Because of this, generating oyster cell line would not only uh, benefit researchers, but it would also generate significant intellectual property, potentially worth millions of dollars, that could significantly bolster Maine's oyster and biotech industries. Uh, because cells from an immortalized cell line are all genetic clones, an oyster cell line would provide unlimited standardized material that would allow for improved reproducibility for experiments with tightly controlled experimental conditions across laboratories. And now with the fully sequenced genome, we can try new methods to uh, establish an oyster cell line. And we, on this project, looked at establishing an iPSC line. So what are iPSCs? Uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, are adult somatic cells that have been reprogrammed to demonstrate the pluripotency of embryonic stem cells. This reprogramming is achieved through the ectopic overexpression of four transcription factors, uh, OCT3 and 4, SOX2, CMYK, and KLF4, and they're known jointly as OSCOM. And they work in a cascade to reprogram cells to uh, stem cells. Uh, and they're a great candidate for generating an immortal differentiable cell line because of their stemness and their pluripotency. So a little background on pluripotency. Um, pluripotency describes the ability of a cell to develop into all three primary germ layers uh, of the early embryo and, and therefore into all cells of the body. Um, this is a diagram of showing a pluripotent stem cell pretty generalized and uh, how it different, can differentiate into any cell type in the human. Uh, uh, but in pluripotent stem cells work the same way for all organisms. Um, so there's two types of stem cells that demonstrate pluripotency, embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells. 
And we're specifically choosing to generate a cell line from induced pluripotent stem cells because there's a labor intensive process of breeding and raising oysters. And there's also ethical concerns from hatcheries that makes it pretty difficult for our lab and other labs to obtain the necessary amount of oyster embryos to establish uh, an oyster embryonic stem cell line. So uh, establishing a mortal cell line for oysters would be a significant step for researchers, but establishing a line of oyster cells that could be derived into any cell type would be pretty monumental for the field. Um, so few groups have attempted to generate iPSCs in non-mammalian species, and only one study has attempted to generate invertebrate iPSCs. While this study noted differences in iPSCs generated uh, from flies uh, following the traditional mammalian reprogramming process, uh, reprogramming to a proliferative state was still demonstrated, and that's what we're mainly interested in looking at. So as you can see, Chrysostoria virginica is not an outgroup right here. Um, of a phylogeny and then on non-mammalian species where reprogramming has been demonstrated uh, to some extent. So to further confirm that IPC generation could be possible in oysters, uh, we wanted to establish conservation of each oscom factor in oysters to make sure that IP the IPSC reprogramming process would function correctly. Um, I was able to use pairwise alignments, uh, which and this is a caricature of all my pairwise alignments for all four of the oscom factors. Um, and I was able to use them to demonstrate that there is conservation between the protein sequences uh, for oyster and mouse uh, oscom uh, transcription factors. So as you can see, the yellow is the mouse uh, proteins and green is the oyster proteins. And to, for two proteins to be conserved, they have to have a percent identity of over 25%. Um, which is m and over a length of more than 100 amino acids. And if we, the, all these proteins with more than 100 amino acids, and as you can see here, the percent identity was higher than 25%. So all the factors were conserved in that criteria. And I also looked for conservation between the DNA binding sites because all these proteins are transcription factors. Um, and these are the darker boxes on the sequences. And we saw that these, uh, see, that these air regions of the proteins were more highly conserved when compared to the entire sequence. So knowing that the, the OSCOM factors were conserved, uh, we surmised that IPSC generation could be possible. We began to establish a framework. So to establish our framework, uh, for I synthesized the many methods for each step of IPSC generation. And I worked with Dr. Fernandez Robledo to determine the best methods to use with our model organism. So I'll first talk about our delivery system. So our lab has recently developed an in vitro method of gene delivery into adult somatic oyster cells using a, a nanoparticle called polyamidoamine dendrimers. And this method is the best gene delivery method we're currently able to use because it causes the least damage to the cells that are uh, transfected. Um, and dendrimers have already been shown to work as a method to generate iPSCs, uh, or as a vector delivery system to generate iPSCs. So polyamidoamine dendrimers are these synthetic spherical macromolecules shown here and here and they bind with DNA and they form a complex that have a net positive charge. And those complexes are, and that complex facilitates the transfer of intact DNA um, into the, through the cell membrane and into the cell, which can then be uh, expressed. So there's two candidate dendrimers that we're interested in looking at. Uh, we're interested in using Superfect, which is a commercial dendrimer um, that we've used in the past with oysters. And we're also interested in, in testing G4 ARG, which is a non-commercial dendrimer um, that has been used to generate iPSCs in mice in the past. So looking at our vector itself, uh, we're interested, or we, we plan to use uh, PCAG OSCOM-G uh, to generate iPSCs. Um, it was developed in 2009 as a single reprogramming vector that could be used for non-viral and non-integrative transfection methods. Uh, the CAG promoter, as seen right here, is uh, actually a modified version of the CMV promoter, which has already been shown to work in oysters. And the only change is uh, there's two additional sequences in it. And we don't think that those sequences will really hinder um, the use of the, the, the job of the promoter in oysters. So this, this promoter is pretty, or this vector is pretty special because it, is, it creates multi cistronic mRNA. So all of these proteins here are joined by P2A sequences. And those P2A sequences are these sequences that are originally reported in P-coronaviruses. And they force cleavage to occur um, 
between two genes or two or more genes that are joined in a sequence via a ribosomal skipping mechanism. And this is a caricature of how that works, sort of. Um, because all five proteins are in one mRNA strand, uh, all right here, and then GFP is the last protein, we can check for the expression of all the protein or of the vector itself um, by uh, using uh, fluorescence microscopy and looking for GFP. So the, the, the genes of each of these OSCOM factors, OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYK, um, are all from mice. And while that might seem strange, uh, previous studies have demonstrated that mouse OSCOM factors typically used in mouse reprogramming will actually reprogram the cells in non-mammalian species. So um, yeah, so that's, what, that's why they're, they're mice and not oyster OSCOM factors in the vector. So after we established the vector and our delivery me method, um, I looked at, I tried to establish a rough outline for our delivery of our vector to our target cells. Um, past studies have serially transfected their cells over the course of around eight to 12 days. And because the time for cells to reprogram is so closely related to the model organism uh, and, and the target cell type, uh, we likely have to determine the ideal length for serial transfections by ourselves. But um, initially we're looking at attempting uh, serial transfections that are separated by uh, every other day over the course of 12 days. Um, and then after that, we'll just look for proliferation because that's what a lot of other studies have done. And that's a good place for us to start. Um, so because the reprogramming process is so closely related to the target cell type to be reprogrammed, um, we wanted to make sure that all our target cell types that we we're gonna attempt to generate iPSCs from would be easy to reprogram because we're in such a such an unusual model species for this. Um, there are a plethora of cell types that have been targeted for iPSC generation. Uh, from the literature, we determined that fibroblasts would, are our best bet for uh, cell, our cellular target, uh, our cell type target. Um, unfortunately, fibroblasts are only characterized in mammals, and they're not characterized in oysters uh, or even bivalves. So to find oyster fibroblasts, we utilize a database of mouse and human cell markers called cell marker and we translated mouse and human fibroblast markers to oysters, and we've already found more than eight highly conserved cell markers. Um, we also plan to establish these mar the expression of these markers using published RNA-seq data, and highly expressed and conserved markers will be used to characterize oyster cells using fluorescence-activated cell sorting. So uh, as you can see in this figure, there's a long and complex process for identifying and characterizing and expanding iPSCs after your programming is finished. Uh, I've really been talking about only this part of it and there's weeks and weeks and weeks more afterwards. Um, but this, this long process afterwards has already been uh, used for many mammalian and non-mammalian species and it really shouldn't change significantly for oyster iPSCs. And to our knowledge, no lab, to our knowledge, no lab has ever seen oyster cells proliferating in vitro. Um, and really all we want to do is we're interested in looking at this re at this time when we're in reprogramming and we want to see if we can see oyster cells reprogramming in vitro and hopefully when we actually attempt this experiment we will. So I'd like to thank uh, everyone at the Big Little RU who took the time to help run and teach such an amazing virtual program. I'd like to thank Dr. Gonzalez, uh, Gonzalez Grassi for um, suggest his suggestions on our project and also giving us the sequence for his plasmid P. Kagoskum G. I'd like to thank Dan Peterson for talking to me about his work to identify and culture stem cells in lobster and crawfish. I'd also like to thank Dr. Burns and Dr. Tyrell for helping me sort through some really large data sets um, when I was looking at cell mark uh, oyster cell markers, trying to find oyster cell markers. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, the NSF for funding this big little RU. So thank you so much for listening and I can take some questions. And David, do you want me to uh, turn off my screen? Um, yeah, turn off your screen and, and we can listen to questions. So there, if there are student questions, you can have them. Otherwise, I have a couple in the chat box. Here I go, Benji. Any idea why the SOX oysters and the mouse proteins are so similar? 
compared to the other three, the other three? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I would suppose that uh, Sox is, I think, more highly conserved across all species or more, uh, a larger range of species in general, because um, it's a pretty essential stem cell. Uh, it's a pretty essential protein in a lot of uh, organisms for stem cells. So I'm not 100% sure why, um, but that would be my guess. David? <laughs> So you put the, the GFP uh, protein in there, and, and that tells you that the gene is being, or the, I guess the vector is being activated. Mm -hmm. But does it tell you if all four, do, do all four genes have to be uh, um, being activated for it to light up, or does it just have to enter into the cell? I mean, does, can it give you a false positive? Um, so we, PCAG OSCOM G is, uh, is a has been used many times and the, the reason they added gfp on was entirely to check for that and um i'm pretty positive that uh they made sure that there was no way for false positive to occur in that way um because i think the how w with how p2a sequences work and with my understanding uh, uh the gfp protein wouldn't be uh expressed in the cell if uh, the other, if the ones before it weren't expressed. Great. That's it. You're out of time. Thank you. That was an excellent talk. Much, much appreciated. Uh, next on there is Cameron. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Thanks, Benji. This is really good. Uh, cool. Okay. Uh, my name is Cameron Carlson. Uh, I'm the intern all the way up in Alaska right now. Uh, I'm from the University of Alaska Anchorage, um, double majoring in biology and chemistry. And uh, this summer I was studying the science of copepod oil sensing and vertical movement response uh, with uh, Dr. David Fields and Dr. Chris Epley. Uh, and so what this project is sort of all about and uh, why we care about it is uh, oil spills. So uh, when there is an oil spill, a typical response to this is uh, the application of chemical dispersants uh, by an aircraft over the surface of the oil spill. Uh, and essentially what this does is it disperses the oil into small droplets, uh, which are mixed into the water column and into, into smaller portions. And uh, there it's, uh, it's a good remediation technique because it increases the rate of biodegradation because uh, increased surface area means increased uh, lipid aqueous interface and faster biodegradation. Uh, but potentially uh, this causes a problem when it's introduced to marine animals. Uh, and so the, the, the critter we're looking at for this is uh, copepods. Um, and what can happen is uh, these copepods become exposed to more hydrocarbons potentially by using a dispersant than rather than just leaving the oil spill alone. Uh, so they can be, so the water soluble hydrocarbons from the oil can uh, get into them just by uh, being in the water with them, or they could directly ingest uh, very small oil droplets. Uh, and so, uh, why then do we, why, why are we looking at copepods uh, and specifically why are uh, the species we chose of copepods uh, Calanus finmarchicus? Um, so copepods are small, uh, or not small, for zooplankton, uh, they're a nice size, uh, two to four millimeters. Um, and uh, they're very special because they, uh, they do a lot of diving. Uh, and that's sort of what we like about Calanus finmarchicus. So uh, they, their overwintering strategy is uh, they dive over 500 meters in the water column uh, to just stay away from the cold. And then they also dive even during their active period over 100 meters uh, during the day. Uh, and then that's pretty much just to avoid predators. Uh, they come up at night to feed on algae. Uh, and they feed on things like, uh, they eat things like dinoflagellates, diatoms, other microplankton. Um, and another really important thing and why they're sort of the basis of what we're looking at this project is they're lipid rich and 
uh, they're the most numerically abundant uh, type of plankton copepods are uh, in in the ocean. So it, where they exist in the ocean, they're hugely important to uh, uh, the food source there. Um, and so uh, any disruption you see in their population or uh, bioaccumulation of toxic compounds is naturally going to create a huge problem uh, when these copepods are in turn eaten by things like uh, fish, marine mammals, and uh, marine birds. Uh, and so sort of the way we're all, we're, we're testing this, uh, or sort of what we want to see is, do copepods move away from uh, oil spills by diving vertically? Uh, are they smart enough to know that oil's there and just get away? Because we know oil's more toxic when we apply dispersants, uh, but what we don't necessarily know is if that even matters, because if they're able to just dive away, uh, then they wouldn't be exposed to it. And so the way we're testing this by establishing an oil gradient is using uh, a mesocosm apparatus, uh, basically tall aquariums, almost two meters tall, uh, in which the copepods are allowed to move around and uh, are typical oil treatment uh, toxicity that would be used in a toxicity test are added to the top. So either oil alone or oil with a dispersant so we can kind of see the difference between them. Uh, and then my sort of portion of this project uh, is looking at what the water chemistry is like throughout the depth of the mesocosm. Um, so there's these sampling ports uh, at five depths uh, that run almost the entire length of the mesocosm. And at uh, over the course of 24 hours, uh, water samples are extracted from them uh, and then they're collected for uh, analyzing later. And uh, we're doing this at multiple time points, uh, just prior to uh, the application of our oil treatment, whether it's oil alone or oil and dispersant, uh, at 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, four hours, or 24 hours, just for our long time point there. Uh, and this works pretty well because for a scaled down version, this is about how long uh, we found that this system can hold a gradient for. And uh, obviously in the ocean where everything's much larger, there'd be a lot more oil present uh, and you know, a lot more water present, uh, a gradient would exist in the water column for a lot longer, enough that this would be a, a practical consideration. Uh, and then these water samples are analyzed uh, on uh, instruments to find out how many hydrocarbons in them. Specifically, we're looking at polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, and this is just um, Mora for scale here on the left to see it in person and uh, or not in person, but just sort of see what it looks like. Uh, so very tall. And uh, here it is kind of doing its thing with a dispersant test. Um, and sort of the way we're understanding what the hydrocarbons are in there uh, and this full spectrum of methods that we're going to perform and have performed is uh, the copepods vertical migration. That's all monitored by cameras, uh, taken a picture, I think, I believe every second. Uh, and Sam McNeely will uh, explain more about that process of it. Uh, but as far as the chemical gradient, which is what I'm analyzing here, uh, that's broken down by, uh, well, first of all, we get the total PAHs uh, and that's done with fluorescence. Uh, and then each individual PAH distinct compound is uh, analyzed, they're, they're quantified with solid phase micro extraction, GC by GC. And then we want to see uh, the distribution of lipid phase oil droplets using epifluorescence. And so uh, what are then PAHs? Uh, so polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are a nice sort of uh, boogeyman for looking at toxicity of oil compounds uh, because they're very persistent and they're mutagenic. And um, the EPA has designated these 16 compounds as priority pollutants based on just how persistent, uh, water soluble, and mutagenic they are. But there's, in theory, basically an infinite number of you know, permutations of these compounds that can exist. Uh, and so uh, what we found was uh, when oil was used alone with no dispersants uh, as a way of sort of validating this mesocosm model and also seeing what gradient looks like uh, with just no with just oil uh, no extern no additional treatments so as if it were just left alone and not remediated um, very gentle gradients going down uh, the 
mesocosm, uh, if present at all, uh, at not very high concentration of oil hydrocarbons. At least we did find this for the first two replicates we performed of it. And then for some reason on our third round of it, uh, we got this really crazy gradients going down. Um, and these are these figures are all, you can imagine them as sort of a cross section of the of our apparatus here, where our depth is displayed on the Y axis and uh, each of these little boxes is a time point. And what we found is there's a much more dramatic, uh, there was a much more dramatic gradient in our third replicate uh, that lasted even up until 24 hours. And this could have been due to uh, less efficient uh, air mixture, which is done to just simulate natural weathering. Uh, but it's not necessarily a bad thing because uh, this is potentially really useful to look at when we compare it to copepod data later on uh, and see if you know there's a difference because oil doesn't always behave the same. If there's a difference between how the copepods respond to a really gentle gradient like this and uh, a really extreme one with a uh, higher concentration up top. And so uh, we were also to perform uh, experiments with dispersant. And so this is sort of the average uh, we saw of the, the one, the, what we just looked at, and compare that to when we added dispersants. Uh, there was a much uh, greater gradient, especially 30 minutes in, and then peters off pretty quickly. Uh, and also just overall a much higher concentration of our PAHs in the water column. Um, and sort of to tie it all together, uh, uh, eventually we'll be looking at the copepod data and how this uh, correlates with this, uh, if they're actually diving in response to it, say in this instance, if they would be going down the water column to avoid this extreme concentration up top. Uh, and uh, we'll also be looking at other chemical methods like the, the oil droplet distribution um, and um, more validating with uh, the GC by GC method. Uh, but that is yet to come. We, we were only able to achieve so much in uh, this short summer over Zoom calls, especially. Um, and sort of why, to bring it together, why this is all important. Um, what we want to know is, is it appropriate to use dispersants in the event of an oil spill? And there's all kinds of gaps in that knowledge. And this is just how we hope to bridge one of those gaps. Uh, you know, if it's found that copepods aren't smart enough to effectively avoid oil, then potentially there's a problem because then they'll pick up all that oil uh, and they'll either die off uh, and people will go hungry for a summer or um, they'll accumulate these toxic oil compounds and those toxic effects will be seen up the food chain. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, di uh, copepods diapause for half the year during the autumn and winter. So potentially this is less of a consideration during, their, during that time. Uh, and with that, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Dr. David Fields and Dr. Chris Epley for uh, their mentorship in this. They were super helpful and uh, awesome uh, mentors. Uh, Aaron Bierne, Maura Nemisto, uh, and another intern who worked on this with me, Sam McNeely. Um, and then all the folks at uh, Bigelow Laboratories and also uh, the Arctic Domain Awareness Center for funding. Nice job. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Are there any questions out there? I have a question. Yes. Great talk. Great talk. Um, so you had mentioned that these zooplankton feed on the phytoplankton, right? And yeah, I was thinking during your talk, well, if the phytoplankton live in the surface waters there and don't tend to also exhibit the diel vertical migration as they move up and down in the water column, would you mind speculating a bit after doing all of this wonderful research, what you think would be the right move as if we should move forward with dispersing or leaving the oil alone? Um. Well, we don't have all the data yet, so it, it would be a very big speculation. Um, <laughs> uh, but if a, a dispersant is very widely used, uh, and it's very useful, especially in areas like the Arctic, where uh, uh, mechanical methods of remediation aren't even possible uh, just because of sea ice or uh, extreme weather, other factors like that. So 
uh, I don't foresee dispersants falling out of popularity, um, but potentially, you know, if we see that this is just causing lethal effects all around, uh, the copepods aren't able to get away from it, then I think it would give uh, at least pause and consideration to these dispersants during their active period, or at least I would hope. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Cameron. Any other questions out there? You have about two minutes, and otherwise I'm reading off the chart or off the chat. Oh, lots of questions. Yeah. Liz, go ahead. I have a quick one, kind of like out of left field, but are there, other than, um, other than copepods, is there anything else like that you might know of in the upper layers of the ocean that might get significantly affected by this that might... I'm not sure. It's just kind of a quick, like, wondering. Um, yeah, I mean, any uh, any more or any organisms, especially microorganisms, are going to be uh, affected by this uh, wherever oil is present. Um, as far as specific species, off the top of my head, I uh, couldn't really say. Um, <laughs> But yeah, copepods just make an ideal sort of uh, mm -hmm. experiment test for it just because they are so important to the food chain. Um, and because uh, they have this cool thing where they can just dive really far and fast. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. Great talk. Uh, so there are a couple of other questions along that same line, but here's a quick one. Was the temperature held constant in your, in your water column? from surface to bottom in the tank and across experiments? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, for the experiments that have been run so far, the temperature has been held constant. Uh, light was provided in a, a spectrum not even that the copepods can't even detect. Um, and But uh, future experiments will test this using a stratified thermocline. Uh, so applying heat to the top of the mesocosm uh, and the idea is that usually induces uh, basically a, a barrier to uh, lipid droplets into the, the lower depths of the tank. Uh, and if we're extending that, uh, that simulation to uh, the, the ocean. And basically what we hope to find there is if there's like an attenuation of where hydrocarbons and oil are able to go, then uh, perhaps the copepods will be okay just sitting just below that that barrier. So yes, uh, for this, it, the temperature was held constant for future experiments, uh, it won't. We'll actually test that using heat at the top. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. I had a wonderful summer. All you, Hannah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Cameron, for that wonderful talk. Um, so my name is Hannah Primiano. I am a rising junior at Drew University. And this summer, I have been working with Dr. William Balch at Bigelow to look at phytoplankton patterns at the subantarctic front in the southern Indian Ocean. So to begin, I'd first like to start by talking about where in the world we're looking. So around Antarctica, there are several boundaries or fronts. And each of these fronts basically indicates a different type of water in the area. So if you look at the image on the left, you can see this dark blue line here is the subantarctic front. And in this area, there is subantarctic mode water. Um, but what's a little bit more interesting than the water itself is what's in the water. So if you look at this uh, image on the right, you'll see in this area, there are high amounts of particulate inorganic carbon. So particulate inorganic carbon is another way to say calcite or calcium carbonate. It all falls in that same area. And so we call this region the Great Calcite Belt because of what we find there. And we find a lot of coccolithophores there. And these coccolithophores use calcium carbonate to form plates around them. And they're a specific type of phytoplankton and they can come in many different shapes and sizes, which I've shown at the bottom here. So all the way on the left here is Emiliania huxili, which is the most abundant form of coccolithophore, found in all different places across the world. 
Um, but as I said, they come in many different shapes and sizes. They can range from five microns to 75 microns. And for reference, the average diameter of one human hair is 70 microns. So these things are incredibly tiny. And so you might wonder, well, why is something so tiny so important? Why should we care about it? Coccolithophores participate in something called carbon fixing. So they take bicarbonate out of the ocean and uh, will transform it into carbon dioxide and calcium carbonate. Now calcium carbonate is also the thing that makes up limestone. And so these can be a little bit heavy. And when coccolithophores die, they sink to the bottom and will form layers at the bottom of the ocean until they form massive structures, such as what we see here on the right, which is the White Cliffs of Dover. All of this is made out of coccolithophores. And so overall, these coccolithophores are acting as a carbon sink. They are taking carbon out of the environment and sequestering it in their plates, and then eventually sinking and letting it uh, end up in the sediment. And this is especially important when we talk about climate change and how we are introducing a lot of carbon into the carbon system. So it's important to know what is taking carbon out of that carbon system. So when we talk about this great calcite belt, we're mainly focused on those coccolithophores, but we started to wonder, well, what other phytoplankton might, might we see there? And so I'm going to introduce some key uh, phytoplankton that we decided to look for in this region. So first we have diatoms. Diatoms are phytoplankton that are found generally at the polar front, which is the region that's just a bit closer to Antarctica. And these diatoms use silicates to make their external structures. In addition, we were looking for uh, cyanobacteria, which are a very, very small type of photosynthesizing bacteria. And finally, we were looking for dinoflagellates. Uh, which are just another type of phytoplankton that can be found in various regions around the world. They're even being studied in the Gulf of Maine right near Bigelow. So looking at all of these phytoplankton, we decided to ask a couple of questions. The first one being, is there a correlation between other phytoplankton groups and coccolithophores? And going off of that, we then decided to ask, well, what, if any, nutrients would be affecting the abundance of these phytoplankton? So to get into this, data was collected off of the uh, coast of South Africa in the Southern Indian Ocean. So this red line that I've drawn in here is the Agullus Current, and it created a meandering system within the Great Calcite Belt itself. And uh, you can also see all of these numbers and colored lines correspond to different legs of the cruise track. And so this was a pretty big area that was sampled. And so in order to narrow down what we were looking at, we decided to look at this point right here, number two. And this is a semi-enclosed cyclonic eddy that had spun off of this meandering system that was created by the Agullus current. So a cyclonic eddy is basically a big swirling pool of water that is creating a depression in the water. And so these images show the sea surface height based on the colors. And you can see that this darker blue here is um, the deeper water. And this middle bit is getting much deeper. In addition, these images show latitude on the y-axis and longitude on the x-axis. And for reference, these markers are um, 100 kilometers long. And so this isn't just a small ripple in the ocean. This was a very prominent feature. And so we decided to sample it twice. The first time it was sampled, there were two interior stations and one center station. And the second time it was sampled, there was one interior station and one center station. And at each of these stations, uh, many different measurements were taken, but the most important to my research was water samples. So water samples were looked at under a microscope and shown under four different types of illumination. So all of these images here are the same um, field, just under different types of illumination to highlight different types of cells. So under bright field, you can see the distinct shape of dinoflagellates. Under polarized light, you can see that coccolithophores glow. Under blue excitation, you can see this red fluorescence is uh, indicative of chlorophyll. And this green fluorescence was generally seen with dinoflagellates, but some other cells as well. And finally, under green excitation, all of these tiny little red dots are cyanobacteria. And so I was able to look at these images and count up all of the cells and then go back and answer some of these questions. So looking at that first question, is there a relationship between these groups? 
our research would suggest that yes, there is. So phytoplankton follow a log scale distribution, which means that all of my data had to be log transformed. Um, unfortunately, there was a lot of fields that I was looking at that just didn't have any cells in them. And so in order to not take the log of zero and get an error, one was added to all of the cells and then the log was taken, which is why you'll see these axes are log of cells per mil plus one. So on the y-axis, we have dinoflagellates, and on the x-axis, we have coccolithophores. And this was the most statistically significant graph that we had. And you can see that they uh, follow an almost one-to-one -one ratio and were very significant. This wasn't the only significant graph that we saw. Um, dinoflagellates and cyanobacteria and coccolithophores and cyanobacteria were also uh, statistically significant. Cyanobacteria were much more abundant than um, any of the dinoflagellates or coccolithophores, so it didn't follow that same one-to-one -one ratio, but they were still very prominent. So now that we know that these groups are co-varying, we decided to look at what nutrients would be affecting them. So there were several onboard experiments that suggested that nitrate was the limiting nutrient for um, all of these phytoplankton. So when we were looking at the nutrients, we expected to see that nitrate would play a big role. And what we saw was that most of the nutrients did have a negative slope, which meant that um, there was some uptake from the cells. However, there was only one statistically significant nutrient, and it was not nitrate, it was silicate. And this was extremely surprising to us because not only was silicate sig statistically significant, but it was only significant with coccolithophores. Normally when we talk about silicate, we only talk about it in regards to di uh, diatoms because diatoms use silicate to make their structures. And we've only seen one paper that might suggest that coccolithophores use uh, silicate at all. Um, so we have two possible explanations for this. The first is that coccolithophores are taking up silicate. And the second explanation is that with higher um, amounts of silicate, diatoms are more present and are either outcompeting or inhibiting the growth of coccolithophores. But we can't say anything definitively um, without more research being done. And there will be more research that is being done. So coming in January, the Roger Revell will be going to the Southwest Pacific Ocean to continue studying coccolithophores and the water at the subantarctic front. And I am lucky enough to go on this uh, research expedition and continue this research and continue looking at all of this. So now I'd just like to say thank you to everyone. First, um, the National Science Foundation for not only funding this REU program, but also for funding both of the cruises that the data was collected on. Second, um, the Bigelow Laboratory team, Dr. David Fields and Roxana Branch and everyone who put this together and fought so hard for this program. Um, also the entire Balch Lab for uh, not only letting me do this data and for helping me answer any of my questions and just for being general, wonderful people. And finally, uh, for the crew and scientific party on the Thomas Thompson, which was the original cruise that collected all of the data that I was able to look at. So I would now like to open the uh, floor up to any questions. The silent claps. <laughs> They're deafening. <laughs> Are there questions out there? Okay, I'm going to read from the box. So how long does it take for enough coccolithophores to accumulate to make the structures like a white cliff, like the White Cliffs of Dover? Okay, that it takes a long, long, <laughs> long time. I don't have an exact um, a time frame for you, but that is like thousands of years, a long time. Millions. Millions, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not short, it's not quick. Are there other questions? Uh, you mentioned one paper that showed a connection between coccolithophores and silica. Can you describe what relationship was, what the relationship was in that study? Was it also a negative correlation, a positive correlation? 
Yeah, so that study was looking at um, a specific type of coccolithophore and trying to figure out if silicate was being used in the calcification process. So they were trying to determine if silicate was um, something that was needed to form all of those little plates that go on the outside of coccolithophores. And they did find that silicate was important in that process. And that's what they were able to prove, or not prove, but look at. Um, were the higher silicate waters also colder? And could that inhibit coccolithophores? Um, so I didn't look specifically at temperature. Um, the temperature in these regions was generally the same though, because uh, we, all of the data was taken in the subantarctic front, which is relatively the same temperature. Um, as you move towards the polar front, it gets to be colder and there are more diatoms there and less coccolithophores. So I'm not sure if the temperature would inhibit them. Um, but in this region specifically, the temperature is relatively constant. Wow, you've sparked some <laughs> chatty interest here um, uh, from Patty. Are the relationships between phytos and nutrients from correlations or actual experiments of nutrient additions? Um, these, my data is specifically from correlations. There were some onboard nutrient experiments, but I didn't uh, look at those specifically. Great. Uh, we have one more question, or one more minute left. So here's a, you're going to have to do a quick answer if we're taking okay. this one. Uh, uh, Durack et al. showed that the silicate was required for normal calcification. They also showed that they have genes for silica trans, oh, that's just a statement. Uh, from Barney. They also show the genes for silica transport. Wild stuff! Exclamation. It is really cool. <laughs> it is really cool. Okay, we're gonna call that one. Thank you. Great talk. Uh, next up, Sam. Are you there, Sam? Did we lose you? Uh-oh. Let's give him a second. I don't think I... Oh, we must have lost him. I don't see him in the... You want me to go ahead, David, and then I think it was after Sam, then he can take my spot? That would be fantastic. Okay. Oh, no, he's back. Oh, Sam, you're back. <laughs> Maybe not. Sorry, it just threw me off, of course, right as I'm about to go. <laughs> right? Of course it happens, though. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. Nope. You're still, you're still good to go. Thanks. Thanks. Katie. Okay, perfect. Way to recover, Sam. <laughs> I had to work against the clock there. <laughs> that was a close one. It's about to move rooms. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, after that, I am now ready to begin my presentation. So, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Sam McNeely, and I'm an RU student at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences during this wild summer of 2020. I'm also an undergraduate student at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington studying marine biology. And this summer I've had the great pleasure of working on a project with fellow REU student Cameron Carlson, who just had his talk a little bit earlier, and research technician Maura Nemisto, and the amazing mentors Dr. Christoph Epley and Dr. David Fields. And this project has been on tiny travelers, the behavioral response of copepod Calanus finmarchicus to crude oil spills. And so how much oil is exactly in the Arctic? A 2008 US geological survey estimated that there's over 90 billion barrels of undiscovered oil in the Arctic circle. Now to you and me, this is just a large kind of incomprehensible number but to put this into perspective, this is over 
20,000 times more oil than was released into the Gulf of Mexico by the BP oil spill of 2010. And as sea ice continues to recede due to climate change, the exploitation of these massive oil reserves will only increase as will transportation across the Arctic. And so this will increase the probability of oil spills to occur. Now there are ways of dealing with oil spills and one of the more common ones is to apply dispersants. Dispersants can be applied to the water surface where the oil slick sits and they break apart the oil particles and send them into the water column. But this has been shown to have negative impacts on the smaller organisms that live in this upper portion of the water column, especially copepods. Now, copepods are arguably the most abundant organism in the ocean. And they're also the foundation of many marine food webs. They're primary consumers, so they eat phytoplankton and are then eaten by succeeding trophic levels. So whatever happens to copepods will then affect the secondary and tertiary consumers. Now, oil and dispersants are around the same, in the same size spectrum as phytoplankton. And so what this means is that copepods have been observed ingesting the oil, which, present, which affects them by giving by experiencing sublethal and lethal effects. And so that then impacts their population and then impacts the rest of the ecosystem. And so now I'd like to talk about a special copepod named Calanus finmarchicus. I've gotten really close with this copepod over the summer, even though I haven't seen them in person, but they're native to the Northern Atlantic and the Arctic Ocean, and they're about two millimeters in length. And so that's about twice the thickness of your fingernail. So they're pretty small, but relatively big for zooplankton. Now during the unfavorable conditions of fall and winter, Calanus winmarchicus dives to depth of over 500 meters, where it remains until the more desirable conditions of spring and summer return, in which case it still makes daily vertical migrations between a depth of about 100 meters during the day, where it avoids visual predation, and the surface of the ocean during the night where it feeds on the previous day's phytoplanktonic bloom. And so our research questions for this study were, does copepod behavior change when exposed to crude oil? And then going off of that, does Calanus finmarchicus actively avoid crude oil in the mesocosm? So our hypothesis is that Calanus finmarchicus will actively avoid the toxic chemicals from crude oil by utilizing its vertical migratory behavior. So for our experiment, we placed the copepods into a two meter tall mesocosm, while four cameras each placed at different depths captured images at one frame per second throughout the duration of the 16 hour control period and the 24 hour treatment period. Now four replicates of these control oil treatment pairs were performed and after the control period, six milliliters of Alaska North Slope crude oil was then added to the tank at the water surface. And that marked the start of the oil treatment period. And so once the, treatment, the treatments were completed, the videos from the cameras were then exported to a computer for further analysis. And so this here is a short clip of a video that was analyzed by counting copepods in the camera's field of view. And an automated system was generated in image J and R to gather and organize the data from those videos for further analysis in both R and Excel. So now on to our results. So for our results, we averaged the four replicates for each camera together at certain times. We then normalized these averages to the end of the stable controls for proportional analysis. Now this graph here shows our results for camera one, which is both labeled and color coded to match the camera depth field on the left, the camera depth figure on the left. And so this just means that camera one is representing the area just below the surface of the of the artificial water column. 
And so for the graph, the x-axis represents the time in hours, and the y-axis represents the percentage of the cocoa pod abundance in the oil treatments compared to the cocoa pod abundance in the controls, which is shown by time zero. And so just what that means is that anything, any number that's above 100% is greater than the cocoa pod abundance in the controls. Anything below 100% is less. And if it's equal to 100%, it matches the control treatment, cocoa pod abundance. And so for our data, we performed an ANOVA and a Tukey's post hoc test on, on the data. And the data points that have differing letters show where a significant difference was detected. And similar lettering just means that no significance was detected between those, those data points. And now interpreting this graph, this just means that after one hour, after the addition of oil, the cocoa pod abundance at the surface decreased significantly by 50% and it never returned to its control levels. And so this is our results for camera two. It's the same type of graph with the same axes as the last one. And so camera two is representative of an area right around half a meter below the water's surface. And the only significant difference that was detected was between our control time at, hours, at hour zero and then the fifth hour mark of the oil treatment. But as you can see the, by the graph, what the graph shows, the cocoa pot abundance is in steady decline over time. And now this again is the same type of graph with the same axes, but now it, it shows the data from cameras three and four, which represent the lower half of the mesocosm. And no significant differences were detected in either camera at any time point. Now, one alarming observation from these experiments was that some copepods actually interacted with the oil. These images here both show a close-up of copepods from the experiment, and the black markings circled in yellow at their heads are either ingested oil or oil that stuck to their carapace. So what does all of that mean? Our results suggest that Calanus humarchicus did not actually avoid the crude oil by migrating down in the water column because there was not a significant increase in coke pot abundance in the lower mesocosm. And that was expected had many of the organisms been moving away from the oil at the surface to the lower portions of the tank. Now, as just previously shown, some copepods were observed interacting with the oil and this raises concerns about copepods ingesting oil or getting stuck in it. And so based on all of these observations, we assume that instead of avoiding the oil, the copepods actually interacted with it and they, they experienced sublethal and lethal effects that led to their immobilization. And that's what caused them to fall out of the, out of the water column. And so what's next for all of this? Continuing with our study, we plan to perform the exact same experiments, but with both crude oil and dispersants. And this will help us to determine when, how and when, if at all, that dispersants should be applied to treat oil spills in order to minimize the environmental impact. And we're also curious as to what attracts the copepods to the, to the oil initially. Within about half an hour after the oil was added, we noticed that there was an increase in copepod abundance at the surface just prior to the fallout that we begin to see around an hour after oil was added to the tank. And so what we're unsure about is if the copepods are actually attracted to the oil or if they're just attracted to the disturbance caused by the addition of the oil at the water's surface. And lastly, alternative methods for cleaning up oil spills must be explored because dispersants do solve some problems but they can actually create more by affecting the lower trophic levels 
which then impacts the entire marine ecosystem. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time. And I'd especially like to thank the National Science Foundation and the Arctic Domain Awareness Center for their support and their funding of my project with the Bigelow Laboratory REU program. I'd also like to thank my incredible, amazing mentors, Dr. David Fields and Dr. Christoph Epley. They were so much fun and so helpful in guiding me and my fellow REU student, Cameron Carlson, through this project. And I'd like to thank Cameron for his help. I'd like to thank the staff at the Bigelow Lab for their support, especially Maura Nemisto, Dr. Abby Tyrell, Aaron Bierne, and my home institution, UNCW. And I'd love to thank my family for all of their support throughout my entire life and my career. All right, and now I'd like to open it up to any questions you may have about the project. Nice job, Sam. Thank you. Uh, questions from the students? I saw you had one in there, Jess. If you want to say it, you can. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll just read it out loud then. Uh, so my question is, you know, if copepods have the potential to migrate hundreds of meters in nature, and they have, um, is it possible that doing this experiment in a two meter tall mesocosm isn't allowing the full range of movement of the copepods and is therefore not fully representative of how they would behave in an oil spill? I suppose it is possible that it's not allowing for their full range of movement, but they should still be able to show movement at some level just because they're, I mean, two meters even to, uh, to them, I mean, they're two millimeters in length. So I see what you're saying, but I think, I think it still could give a representation of it and of their movement patterns. And also a 100 meter tall mesocosm would be a little bit more difficult to make. I mean, <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. We have one minute. And so this is a methodological, or not a methodological, this is a philosophical kind of thought. Any ideas why the copepods didn't move away from the oil? Is it possible that they stick with their food source? Suggesting that the food source might be in the upper part. And she asks, um, was there food in the tank that could have driven this top activity? There was no food in the tank uh, when the oil was added. They were fed outside of the treatments, but once they were inside the experiments, they were not fed anything. So a possibility that I suggested was that they could think that what's being added is food. And so that could be what attracts them to the oil if they're not just attracted to the oil by some chemical or something. And then they could either ingest the oil or get stuck in it. And then that could cause them to fall out. Um, but yeah, <laughs> good question. Great, thank you. Let's move on. Okay. Go Katie. That was great, great oh, Sam. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. One sec, you guys are, little faces are in my way. There we go. Oh. Hi. So, hi everyone. My name is Katie Spires and I go to Colby College in Waterville, Maine, where I study chemistry. And this summer I had the opportunity to continue working with Jim McManus on a project that I began as part of the 2019 RU program. So, my research is part of a much larger effort focused on sedimentary chromium and chromium's potential to serve as a proxy for past ocean oxygen levels. The goal of my current research, which I'll present to you today, is to calibrate this proxy by identifying processes that control if and how chromium gets buried in marine sediments. So chromium has the potential to serve as an indicator of past ocean chemistry because chromium solubility is very sensitive um, to the presence or absence of oxygen. Just as a reminder, oxidation state simply describes the number of electrons that an that an atom must gain or lose in order to form a bond. 
Um, when an atom gains electrons, we say that it is reduced, and when an atom loses electrons, we say that it's oxidized. So in the ocean, chromium has two common oxidation states, plus six, which is very soluble, and plus three, which is pretty insoluble. Under oxid conditions, chromium is present in both of these states, but when the conditions are anoxic, so no oxygen, chromium is reduced to its plus three state, which causes it to fall out of the water column and land in the sediment layer. And because chromium solubility is so sensitive to oxygen, we believe that by measuring the abundance of chromium in the sediment layer, we can predict how much oxygen was dissolved in the water when those sediments were first formed. Understanding past ocean oxygen levels is really important because it could help us understand the evolution of oxygen in the ocean as well as impacts of climate change. So in order for us to use this proxy to its full extent, we needed to identify factors other than oxygen concentration that might influence chromium's abundance in the sediments. My research aims to answer this question, what other biogeochemical processes affect chromium burial in marine sediments? So I began my research by coming up with the first with a few hypotheses. The first one was that a high concentration of iron oxides would result in a high concentration of sedimentary chromium. And this hypothesis is based on the fact that chromium tends to associate with iron oxides, which we think will then pull it down so it lands in the sediment layer. And then my second hypothesis was that a high concentration of organic carbon would result in a high concentration of sedimentary chromium as well. And this hypothesis is based on past research, which indicates that organic carbon is able to reduce chromium to that insoluble plus three state. So for my research, I used sediment cores that were collected at eight different study sites. Two of those sites were located near the Dorado outcrop, which is shown in this map here to the left off the coast of Costa Rica. And then my other six sites were located along the California and Mexico continental margins, which are shown in this map to the right. And all of my sites were chosen because we knew beforehand that they demonstrated a, um, they all demonstrated pretty different levels of bottom water oxygen concentration, which we knew would allow us to investigate how different chemical conditions might affect the processes that we're studying. So in order to explore the effects that iron and organic carbon have on chromium burial, we needed to extract these elements from our core samples and measure their abundances. This image here to the right shows what one of our cores looked like before we had performed any analyses. And prior to performing any extractions, I spent a pretty extensive period of time developing various different methods. And I'm not going to get into those now, but I'm happy to chat about them after if people are interested. So we ended up using a dithionite extraction method because dithionite is known to be selected for iron oxides as opposed to other phases of iron. And after I finished these extractions, I used an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer, which um, is just a big word <laughs> for or a, a fancy type of mass spec. And I used that to measure iron and chromium concentrations. And then I was really lucky because organic carbon data was already available for the sediment cores I was working with, so I didn't need to collect that. So once we got our data back, we started by looking at the relationship between chromium and iron oxides in all of our samples. So in this figure here, you'll see iron oxide concentration is on the x-axis and chromium concentration is on the y-axis. And the colors and symbols of all of these data points simply reflect which sites the samples were collected from. So gray is for samples within 10 meters of the Dorado outcrop, orange is samples within a kilometer, and then blue is for samples along the continental margins. And there's a pretty clear trend in our data which shows that as iron oxide concentration increases, chromium concentration tends to increase as well. And this is pretty cool because it supports our first hypothesis, which said that chromium would associate with iron oxides, and those iron oxides would then deliver chromium to the marine sediment layer. We did notice, however, that this trend does not seem to hold true for the continental margin samples, so which these ones in blue are those. Um, so we decided to take a closer look at them. 
This next graph here is the same as the first one I showed you, but it only displays data from the continental margin sites. So you notice the axes are the same with iron oxide and chromium, but their scale is much smaller. And when we looked at this data, we saw that that chromium iron oxide trend, it holds true within each core, as you can see from the trend lines, but it definitely doesn't hold true overall. We can see that there's an increased concentration of chromium at the Soledad and San Blas sites over here to the left, despite them having a low concentration of iron oxides. Uh, now these two sites, they differ from all the others because we know that the water directly above them lacks oxygen. So with that in mind, our data suggests that in the absence of oxygen, or that the absence of oxygen causes elevated chromium levels. And we think that most, if not all of the available chromium at these two sites um, is being reduced to its insoluble plus three state and is then deposited in the sediment layer. So in this case, chromium doesn't need the help of iron oxides to carry it to the sediment layer. Next, we took a look at the relationship between chromium and organic carbon. So here the x-axis is percent carbon and the y-axis is chromium concentration. And just like the first graph, all the different colors and symbols simply represent where our samples were collected. So looking at this graph, it's pretty obvious the data can be divided into two groups, samples with high carbon over here and samples with low carbon down here. And for our purposes, I'm gonna define high carbon as anything above 2% and then low carbon as anything below 2%. And just from looking at this, it looks like there's probably no relationship between chromium and carbon when carbon is low, but there might be some relationship up here when carbon is high. So again, we wanted to take a closer look. And um, so this graph on the left shows that carbon chromium relationship when chromium is low, when carbon, excuse me, is low. And then this graph on the right shows that relationship when carbon is high. And we can see that we're pretty correct. There is basically no relationship between carbon and chromium when chromium is low, R squared of 0 0.0002. But then when the carbon's high, we can see there's a pretty significant relationship. As carbon increases, chromium tends to increase as well. And this, this trend here on the right supports our second hypothesis, which said that organic carbon would reduce chromium to its insoluble plus three state, which would cause it to accumulate in the sediments. One important thing to consider is what a high percent carbon might indicate about the conditions of the sediments. So past research tells us that the longer carbon is exposed to oxygen, the more carbon will be converted to CO2 and leave the sediment layer. So with this in mind, we can understand that this high percent carbon, these high percent carbon samples over here likely there's not a lot of oxygen in those sediments, um, at least in comparison to the low carbon samples. So the big takeaway from the chromium versus carbon data is that when the sediments lack oxygen, um, a significant amount of iron oxides are not able to form and reduction via carbon or maybe sulfides, which we didn't get into, uh, becomes the dominant control over chromium burial. So, to summarize all of our research, we first found that under oxidizing conditions, adsorption onto iron oxides is the dominant control over chromium burial, but under anoxic conditions, reduction of chromium to insoluble chromium-3 via organic carbon or maybe sulfides becomes the dominant control over burial. These findings are important because they inform our understandings of how chromium accumulates in marine sediments. So for example, say we had two locations with comparable concentrations of dissolved oxygen. We now know that if one of those locations had a lot more iron than the other, that location would be able to form more iron oxides, which would lead to more chromium being delivered to the sediments at that location. So if we want to use chromium abundance as a proxy for past ocean oxygen levels, it's really important that we take all of these findings and all these processes into account. And with that, 
I want to thank you all for listening to my talk. And I'd especially like to thank my mentor, Jim, for all of his help and guidance over the past year, not just summer, but year. And David for being such a great leader in the RU program. Sarah Rauschenberg for answering all of my questions in the lab and then the big old community as a whole for providing me with this opportunity and so much support. And with that, I'm good to open it up if anyone has questions. Uh. I had a quick question. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about your method development and some of the other extraction methods that you tested out. Yeah, totally. Um, good question. So my research last summer during the 2019 RU program was really focused, uh, was more focused on methods development and coming up with different extraction methods that would work well for my project, but also that could be used with isotope analyses because eventually we want to look at chromium's isotope composition in my samples um, in addition to just its abundance. So we started out knowing that dithionite which we used, um, is commonly used for metal extractions, but it's not really used when we're extracting metals to then be analyzed for their isotope compositions. But then hydrochloric acid, on the other hand, is commonly used for isotope analyses. So last summer, I identified, I tested out a bunch of different methods with hydrochloric acid and dithionate and whatnot, and I identified a method using one molar hydrochloric acid that could be used to produce pretty similar, um, pretty similar metal extractions to dithionite, but it could be it could also be used when um, performing isotope analyses. So I haven't done the I, I haven't used that method to do the isotope analyses yet. I, I don't know if <laughs> I personally will, but we have someone working in New Jersey who's hopefully going to do those isotope analyses for us. That sort of came out of the methods development that was part of this project. So, yeah. We have one minute. Uh, why do you think there's so much iron and chromium 10 meters out from the Dorado outcrop? Yeah, um, I think like my personal thing is there's a lot of discharge coming out of the outcrop like in that area. And some research says, uh, some doesn't, some does, but some research says that chromium, for example, is, um, like more easily dissolved in the hydrothermal waters that that discharge is made of. So there would be more chromium coming out in that area and it would be more available to get put into the sediments, which is something to think about. And probably same goes for iron. I'm not really positive there. Yeah. Great. You're right on time. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Est guys. Estelle, load yourself up. All right. Ready to go. Thank you, Katie, for that talk. That was wonderful. Um, I'm Estelle Baldwin. I'm also a rising senior at Colby College. And this summer, I had the honor of working with Dr. Patricia Matrai from Bigelow Labs. And we were looking into community respiration in the coastal waters of the Gulf of Maine. And this is a beautiful picture of the um, Kennebec estuary. You can see it's in full springtime bloom with the Kennebec River running through um, down to the Gulf of Maine, which is the location of this study. So why aquatic respiration? Well, each ecosystem has something called the net ecosystem production level, or the NEP, which is equal to all levels of respiration subtracted from all levels of primary production. And just um, a quick note, I might be using primary production, production, respiration interchangeably. Um, whenever I use these terms, I'm referring to the production of oxygen in the ecosystem. But finding this NEP value places each ecosystem on the continuum from an autotrophic system where primary production dominates to being a heterotrophic system. And on an annual basis from surface levels to depth, the global oceans are actually net heterotrophic as a system that's been found. What this means is that respiration dominates. So in this process, organic matter gets decomposed, oxygen is consumed from the waters, and carbon dioxide is released. And at the ecosystem level, aquatic respiration is the greatest sink for organic matter in the biosphere, but it's also the largest gap in our knowledge of the carbon cycle and an essential component um, when we want to try to model it. So it's important to study. 
Also, every other breath that you take is produced by phytoplankton. So we know a lot about photosynthesis and its seasonality and its controlling factors, but we're lacking studies on respiration which are independent from those of photosynthesis. And in this study, we're hoping to quantify the cycle of respiration and its controlling factors independent from those of photosynthesis. Another reason why this study is so important and why I especially was interested in this study was because of the climate implications. Especially, um, we're dealing with a portion of the carbon cycle, one that produces carbon dioxide, and the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the surface layers of the oceans can greatly influence those that are in the atmosphere, um, so making this a climate issue. Another reason why this has climate significance is because respiration has been seen to be a function of temperature with increasing rates of respiration with higher temperature concentrations. So you can imagine it's kind of a nasty positive feedback cycle where you have higher temperatures leading to higher respiration rates, further carbon dioxide released, and so on. So the location of the study, here we have the Kennebec River running down into the Gulf of Maine. Um, for context, my home institution, Colby College, is right around here. We have Portland in the south and Booth Bay Harbor around here. And now if we look at this red box in greater detail, you can see the five stations from which we sampled from. Um, and here, um, it was a unique location because we had these gradients in both salinity and uh, nutrients. So these plots here are just a uh, single cruise data that was made available that show the difference in salinity and nutrients, nitrate and nitrite between these stations. So you can see starting at stations one and two, which are still within the Kennebec estuary, we have more freshwater, so lower salinity, but we have higher nutrients because of the input from this river. As you move away, salinity increases as we go into these marine environments, but the nutrients, nitrate and nitrate seem to decrease. So we had this to work from, which was a very interesting location. So the methods of this study, uh, the field data was collected from a Bigelow team. I did not collect the data myself, obviously, but it was in the Gulf of Maine from March 2005 to December 2006, so about two years. And I'm also utilizing global respiration data provided by Dr. Kale Robinson. Um, and I'm using Excel and R-Suite to uh, examine the variation in respiration and the statistically significant parameters of this. So here, I, my first question was, does respiration have a seasonal cycle in the coastal Gulf of Maine waters before going any further? So here we have the average monthly respiration for every station, which can explain the error bars on each of these um, throughout the two year sampling period. So we have respiration on the y-axis. Again, um, every time I say respiration or primary production, I'm using micrograms of carbon per liter per day, so a rate. But if you follow along, you can see that there is an increase during the spring bloom of 2005 with a peak around June, a uh, decrease even into negative values during the winter months, and an increase once again in the spring bloom around August of 2006. So there does appear to be a seasonal cycle, but the more interesting thing I think is when you plot this on top of primary production. So here we have again respiration in blue um, over the two year cycle, and this corresponds to the y axis on the right, where we, and then we have primary production in orange corresponding to the y axis on the left hand side. The first thing I want to draw your eye to before going into the patterns of these two is the difference in axes between respiration and primary production. So primary production goes all the way up to about 1400 micrograms of carbon per liter per day, whereas respiration, we only have up to 250. So clearly this system, this coastal estuarine system is net autotrophic and not net heterotrophic um, as the annual global oceans are. So that was the first thing that jumped out at me when I looked at this. The next interesting part was that in 2005, the peak of respiration actually occurred before the peak of primary production. Whereas in 2006, we saw what was more historically expected for the peak of respiration to come after the peak in primary production. So from this chart, it was clear that these two uh, cycles are obviously similar with the same seasonality. However, one does not directly uh, affect the other because of the lag we saw in 2005. So that brought me to look into what other parameters might be influencing respiration in these waters. One of the first ones I looked at was temperature. I had found in other studies that respiration was a function of temperature. So here you have temperature um, in, in degrees Celsius and respiration. 
And while this uh, trend does not seem very strong, um, temperature is statistically significant on respiration, and it does account for about 23% of the variation observed in respiration. So from this, I knew that temperature was going to be at least one of the variables that I would include in my model, but I knew that there is likely more, so I went on to do a multiple linear regression analysis. This is actually the output from a relative importance graph, which tells you the percent of respiration which each variable is responsible for. So just to introduce you to the variables we're dealing with here, um, we have nitrate and nitrite, um, we have phosphate and silicate, which are all nutrients. There are also biological parameters, including chlorophyll A, which is a proxy for the phytoplankton abundance, um, bacterial abundance, which is a proxy for the players in respiration, as well as the rate of primary production. Um, and then on top of that, we have environmental factors, temperature, salinity, and dissolved organic carbon. So with this relative importance graph, I also did an ANOVA analysis to see the statistical significance between the parameters and respiration. And this showed me that phosphate and chlorophyll were both statistically significant, but even more so were nitrate, nitrite, temperature, and primary production. And we wanted to find a way to predict respiration as a function of parameters that are easier to measure than respiration itself. Uh, which is why we ended up doing the study, but that's why we ended up choosing these variables, which were statistically significant from the relative importance output as well as the ANOVA. And that brought us to this model. So this equation is what we hope to test. This includes variables primary production, temperature, chlorophyll, nitrate, nitrite, and phosphate. Now we wanted to apply this model to a data set that was not the same location from which the algorithm was derived. So that brought me to the global data set from uh, Carol Robinson. So we started off with about 4,500 data points. That was all of the global data. But in order to compare apples to apples to have the same environmental factors, we had to narrow it down. So we started off by narrowing it down to just temperate regions. Um, it also had to be only coastal and shelf regions, surface waters only, because that's where our samples were taken from. On top of that, it had to have at least primary production, chlorophyll, and temperature. So from 4,500 points, we are left with 50. So not very many, but enough to plot. Um, and here you have the location of those 50 points, both in the North Sea and off the coast of Great Britain. Unfortunately, nutrient data was not available from this global data set. So we had to apply a reduced model, which was just including primary production, temperature, and chlorophyll. And that got us here. So here you have the observed respiration along the x-axis in micrograms of carbon per liter per day, um, which is the actually measured respiration at each of these locations, and then the predicted respiration using my model. An ideal situation would be for this to have a one-to-one -one relationship where the model accurately predicts the respiration at every point. Obviously, that did not happen <laughs> in this case, um, especially with lower measured respiration. Our model tended to over-predict respiration, um, but we wanted to see uh, what the effect of nutrients would do for this model. So because nutrient data was not available for the North Sea, we used the Gulf of Maine data to test the influence of nutrients with this model. So here you still have the blue line with the North Sea. Um, the dashed lines are just the 95% confidence intervals. But then if you take a look at the yellow line versus the red line, the yellow line shows the Gulf of Maine data, which included the nutrients in the model. And the red line used the same algorithm without nutrients that was applied to the North Sea. So just from these R squareds, um, I don't know if you can read it, but the R squared for this yellow line was about 0.34 compared to the red line, which did not include nutrients, which was 0 0.002. So clearly nutrients were very influential in the predictability of respiration. And um, the model without nutrients was actually just as bad on the North Sea data as it was in the Gulf of Maine. So it wasn't just the location that was throwing it off. So then with this, what can we conclude from this study? Well, we know that respiration has a seasonal cycle and it relates to that of primary production, but sometimes it lags or coincides, um, lagging as we saw in 2005. We also know that the coastal Gulf of Maine surface waters are net autotrophic, um, that nutrients including nitrate, nitrite, 
and phosphate, as well as chlorophyll, primary production, and temperature um, account for most of those seasonal variability and respiration, as they were statistically significant in our model. And our linear model does not account for enough of the variability in controls in coastal systems. Um, so then how could we make this better, I guess? Well, what's next? Um, so the next part would be to quantify respiration, which includes these allochthonous, terrestrial, and hydrological inputs. Our ecosystem was unique in that it was a coastal estuarine system. And most of the studies today on aquatic respiration focus on open ocean, unproductive areas where respiration is typically lower along with primary production. So the models do not include these inputs, which are greatly influential on the respiration of the area. Another thing that would be good to consider is the community composition of the ecosystem there. Knowing the species that exist are greatly influential on the processes that go on there. And while that data was not available for this data set, it would be uh, very influential to look into. And with that, I'd like to thank the cruise team who collected this data in the Gulf of Maine. Um, I'd also like to thank NASA for the field grant that allowed that data collection to happen, the National Science Foundation for the wonderful Bigelow REU program, my home institution, Colby College, and Bigelow Laboratory, and everybody who made the summer so great, regardless of the circumstances. And with that, I will take questions if anybody has any. Good to go. Uh, you have about two minutes. Uh, are there any questions from the group? I have one for you, Estelle. Mm -hmm. Fantastic talk. It was great to hear your uh, passion through the words. Um, so you talked about that data that compared 2005 and 2006 respiration and primary production. Why exactly does respiration peak before primary production in 2005? Right, thank you for that question. Um, so yeah, as I said, we would expect what happened in 2006, where the respiration is able to peak after primary production because of the available organic carbon produced during that peak in photosynthesis and primary production. But in 2005, there was actually record rains. And because we were in this terrestrial, um, in this estuarine coastal system, the discharge from the river was much higher that year. So the supply of organic carbon from the river actually was able, or I'm guessing was the reason why respiration was actually able to occur um, prior to the primary production bloom of that season. Neat. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. So we have one more minute and Patty has one in there, but I'm gonna let her talk to you about that and I'm gonna take Barney's question. Um, were your data for the surface samples only, or did you integrate across the water column? Did your model have a depth term? Our data was only from surface samples only. Uh, we did not include depth because respiration does differ uh, throughout the depth. Fantastic. That's your last question you're going to get. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I just want to say I encourage the students to look inside the the questions, I mean, there's a lot of them that are being asked that we just don't get to deal with here, but it's good for you to look at those so you, you see what, what uh, people were wondering about. Uh, Turner. Um. Do you guys remember how to do the advanced chair? Wait, I got it. Advanced. Bah, bah. Oh, wrong. So sorry. Okay, how's that look? Um, um, we can still see part of your other screen. Oh, okay. Hmm. I think the way you had it before was good if you want to go back to that. Okay. Sorry, I thought I worked this out. All right, how's this one? Great. Okay, so uh, my name is Turner Johnson. I'm a rising junior at Haverford College. And this year I was working with Nick Record um, on forecasting whale populations in the Northwest Atlantic with machine learning and big data. 
So this is a computer simulation of the North Atlantic right whale. Um, they were hunted to near extinction in the 1800s um, as they have a friendly disposition towards humans and they also float when they're killed. In the 70s, the Endangered Species Act um, established the need for defining critical habitats, which are off limits to shipping routes and fishing grounds. This is due to the incredibly important function whales provide in the marine carbon and oxygen cycles. Ding, please let me. Next, okay. So within the past 10 years, right whales have been following Calanus, their main food source out of protected areas. So this uh, chart on the left is from my mentor Nick's recent paper. Um, the colors show the slope of copepod distributions between 2006 and 2014 with red as increase and blue as decrease. And Nick found that where Calanus goes, right whales soon fall. Follow. And so we can trace back this domino effect to its source, which is climate change. So as I mentioned before, um, whales are deviating from their typical foraging migration routes. And it turns out that right whales in particular, um, are their anatomy are incompatible with tags. So um, our project has been to estimate future whale distribution using a predictive model. And so another issue is that we don't have a way to directly measure calanus levels. Um, and so the way that we get around this is by thinking about environmental conditions that correspond with whale encounters. And if we look at this simple trophic food web, we can see that a variable like chlorophyll is gonna be very important to the model. And so uh, the lab is working on applying for a NASA ecosystem forecasting grant. And so I'm fine tuning a, pre a preliminary model that is intended to go into this proposal. So some of the research questions that we're asking are, um, can we use um, whale presence uh, sorry, can we use satellite data um, to predict whale presence uh, using a Calanus proxy layer? And so um, these predictor layers describe the environmental, in including uh, chlorophyll, um, describe the environmental conditions that attract or dissuade whale presence. Um, there are also large swaths of data that are gathered by geosynchronous satellite, um, such as sea surface temperature, um, photosynthetically available radiation, uh, particulate inorganic, organic carbon, and bathymetry. We're also investigating how adding derived predictor layers affects the model's reliance on these layers, um, and also um, how the observation type and score affect the model. And so one of the big data sets that we're using is the whale observation model from Hanson Johnson at Dalhousie. Um, and so this, uh, data, this, this data set takes into account not only right whales, um, but also bigger players in, not necessarily bigger, but other players um, in the North Atlantic food web, such as these whales. And so we're also wondering if we can learn more about how this uh, food web interacts. So what model are we using? We are using the Maxent model for machine learning. Um, so Maxent, um, here we have a table of observations that goes into a particular model. So there, this is only a sample of these uh, entries that are really about 70,000 rows. Um, and so to make specific models, we filter this data using model parameters. For example, the type, which is acoustic or visual so far, um, the score, definite or possible sighting, and we also look at different species. So the predictors, so this is a map of the Northwest Atlantic with Nova Scotia in the middle, and it shows the predictor values for a certain day. So to get, so the, to get a sense, um, of the total amount of data we're using. Imagine a stack of each of these five predictors um, for like however many years that we're using. Um, so we have taken a, an amount specified by model parameters, uh, randomly selected as input for the model, and we use uh, a different set of randomly selected slices of these same stacks to provide interpolated, select, in, interpolated conditions um, for the model to project upon. And so this data, sorry, is taken by the Alcomotus satellite. So the output of this model is what you can see here in this purpley spectrum is the, the uh, likelihood of encountering a whale on a specific day. Um, and so the model outputs one of these predictions for every day of the year. And the green, we have um, the known observations on that day. And so if we zoom in, we can see how well the model did at predicting where whales would be seen or heard. And so you can see that it did pretty good in the San Lorenzo Gulf region, but we don't really have the observational data, uh, for example, from the coast of Labrador. So we can't really tell how the model did there. Um, so the grant proposal um, with, the, with the final version from the grant proposal, um, uh, it could go into um, compelling further surveys to take place. So, 
um, defining some terms for the variables that I interact with throughout this project. So you can see on the right three large groupings that I mentioned in the previous slide. We have predictors, um, model parameters, um, and observation parameters. And so I've been working with uh, first polygons, which can be used to mask re the region further. Um, and back, which is the number of background points. And so that's a random sampling of the predictor layers, which represents the environmental conditions of the background as opposed to the observed data points. And so it kind of simulates absences. Um, and then we have, uh, as I mentioned, the observational parameters, uh, limiting the amount of whale observations that go into the model, and then the tags for score and type. And so uh, visual and acoustic, for example, um, data is gathered from vessels, ocean gliders, planes, and buoys. So here's a chart of what we did. Um, one of the first things that we did is we restricted two of the variables that I just mentioned, um, the, the presence max, and I also masked the region. Um, I'll show why right here. So this is before we curate bathymetry and presence. And so the big takeaway um, from this chart, which is kind of an analysis of a model, is the middle chart, um, which shows the AUC or area under the curve, and it assesses how well the model fits observations. And so on a scale from zero to one, uh, where one represents a model that doesn't predict any false positives, um, this model has a lot of variation in AUC. And so we're trying to understand why. Um, so another issue that we see with this is that um, these, this bottom region is um, the uh, contributions that go into the plot along the day of year, which is the x-axis. Um, and so we can see that this model relies pretty much year round on bathymetry. So now looking at the top plot, um, these are the amount of counts, presence versus background. Um, that go into the model where this big blue jaggedy line is the amount of presence points. And so this would be fine and dandy, except that we do see this inverse relation between AUC and uh, presence points. So how do we fix the model? We restrict bathymetry uh, to being above 1,000 meters, and we set a presence maximum at 200 points. And so now we can see that the model relies much more evenly on all of its different contributors, and there's no longer this inverse effect uh, between AUC and presence points. Um, and so now variations in AUC can be attributed to more interesting reasons. So now that we have values for that, we ran a convergence test using 10 models to determine um, the numerical uh, value for n back, uh, which provides um, the most accurate amount, um, most accurate model with um, the least amount of background points because the more background points you have, um, the more time the model takes to run. So this is more about efficiency. So using um, our converged uh, end back of 1200, um, we have started making <clears throat> um, species models. And into these species models, in, in, in addition to end back, um, we are incorporating uh, three new predictor layers. Uh, bathymetry slope, sea surface temperature slope, and cumulative chlorophyll A. Um, and so the intent is that cumulative chlorophyll uh, will, will represent um, all of the data, I mean all of the, um, chlor all of the chlorophyll that the colonist has eaten um, throughout the year. So we do these uh, models for all five whale species that we have, um, which we can see uh, in the background of this chart. And so the results from this um, so these are the same plots uh, as before, except without the presence and background points. And so this is examining the effect of the three new contributor layers on all five species. And so as I mentioned in the top, and as I mentioned previously, in the top plot we have the AUC in black. In the bottom plot we have contributions, and the lower, lower of the two rows has the new predictor layers added. And so uh, we can see that um, this is the model's new reliance on bathymetry slope. This is the model's new reliance on cumulative chlorophyll A. And this is the model's new reliance on sea surface temperature slope. Uh, if you look in the say whale, um, it's the little pink boxes. And so um, we do notice a higher uh, year round AUC with the new models um, and a good amount of reliance on pretty much all of these except uh, sea surface temperature slope. Um, but most notably, 
uh, and in accordance with ecological models, um, we can see that the right whale model relies heavily on cumulative chlorophyll A in late summer when Calanus begins to aggregate into large enough groups that right whales end up eating them. And so as such, we uh, can conclude that chlorophyll A acts as an effective, pro an effective proxy for Calanus abundance. So um, we uh, initially constrained some parameters and that made qualitative analysis um, of all subsequent models much easier. And the addition of derived predictor layers, um, which are intended to mod model seabed slope and total chlorophyll eaten by Calanus provide significant contributions, particularly that integrated chlorophyll A serves as a proxy for zooplankton abundance. Um, and so this is all in the context of trying to um, like long-term reduce whale mortalities um, and future versions of this model uh, if, if the NASA grant goes through, uh, will guide future survey efforts, inform offshore wind development industry, and potentially advise policy decision making for NOAA and fisheries. Um, so in terms of this model, future directions include, as I mentioned, survey efforts. We're also thinking of incorporating whale watch data as a different type in, a, in addition to um, definite and possible, I think. We're also thinking of incorporating opportunistic and we are also considering integrating other parameters such as particulate, inorganic, and organic carbon, and maybe photosynthetically available radiation. And so I just want to um, say thank you to the Bigelow RU program and David Fields, both fun are funded by NSF, um, and also my mentor, Nick Record, and Benjamin Tubber, who helped me a lot along the way, as well as Hanson Johnson, who we got our uh, large data set from, and Daniel Pendleton at the New England Aquarium. Thank you. Trying to make enough noise for the 56 other people that are out there. <laughs> uh, if you stop sharing your screen, are there any questions out there? So I got one. David. Um, so with the whale sightings, I mean, those are one of those rare, uh, rare sightings. And is there any control for whether it's a repetitive sighting of the same whale or if it's, um, they're all unique sightings for different whales? And um, there is no real way to tell that um, other than um, because I mean, the only way that you would be able to tell that is either visually or with a tag. And so I do know that, um, I don't think the data set has any, um, like, organization of which whales are which, especially because right whales are pretty much only identified visually um, with their, like, specific scarring and um, little bumps of barnacles and stuff. So I think that it's it, it just models whale encounter, but if you plot it, you can sometimes see like there's this like line and so uh, of observations and that's probably from like acoustic data recording like position. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna tack on another minute just because you were behind and Abby asks, uh, you said that an AUC of one means no false positives. How does your model deal with false negatives? Um, so uh, we basically used just AUC as an assessment um, to like, so for the, for when a model, um, so the AUC kind of rep represents the, the ratio of rates of testing false negatives versus false positives. And, and I'm not super confident of like how that works statistically, um, but uh, our model, so if, if I go back to, um, my, or if you recall that in your mind, um, they're not, almost none of them reach exactly one. Um, and so our model does not do a perfect job, um, but usually they hover around 0.8 or 0.9, especially after adding um, the three new layers. So a 30% failure rate max, maybe. Great, thank you. Uh, Molly, load her up. Alrighty. 
Great talk, Turner. Okay. So hello, my name is Molly Spencer. I am a junior at the University of Southern Maine. And this summer I've been working under the mentorship of David Fields in the research of day and night influence, influences on the zooplankton community in a coastal environment. So at the center of this study is the awareness of how incredibly important zooplankton are in maintaining foundational energy providing trophic levels within subsurface life. Essentially, they are the key link between phytoplankton and secondary consumers. Zooplankton drive energy transfer up marine food webs to secondary and tertiary consumers, including many species of commercial value in Maine, like the Atlantic cod, herring, and lobster. It is the movement and dispersal of zooplankton that can directly impact feeding of these marine inhabitants and subsequently their developmental growth. But despite zooplankton being a crucial part of every marine ecosystem and subsequently the marine economy, there is a lack of research regarding their positional behavior within the Gulf of Maine. More specifically, the population's response to dial vertical migration or DVM influences. DVM is the synchronized movement of zooplankton up and down a water column over a daily cycle. And vertical distance traveled by any one individual can be tens or hundreds of meters within just a few hours. Zooplankton normally ascend towards the surface at dusk and descend back to deeper water before dawn, but reverse patterns can also occur. Several studies of potential influences on DVM in zooplankton communities have been assessed, such as predation, light availability, um, nodigous drive, and general body condition, but few have studied these dynamics in a shallow-bodied environment. Our research proposes an analysis into the diversity and abundance of zooplankton species that are seen over the course of a dial cycle within coastal waters, and to hopefully gain a better understanding of this animal's dispersal behaviors. So for our sample site, we assessed one water column environment located within the shallow shore of the Mariscotta River off of Bigelow Labs Pier in Booth Bay, Maine. On the left, you can see a picture of the coast of Maine with Cape Cod as reference. And on the right side, you can see a more direct picture where you can see the Mariscotta River flowing into the coast. So for our methods, the zooplankton samples consisted of five daytime vertical toes and three nighttime vertical toes, all done at high tide. These were quantitative net toes done with a 1.5 meter long, 15 centimeter diameter conical net and with a mesh size of 150 microns. And to put that in perspective, that is approximately the thickness of two human sized hairs. Our toes were lowered at about six meters deep with the whole water column site being about nine meters deep. We also collected the environmental data from our CTV instrument, which is deployed to the bottom of our water column, so roughly nine meters deep every time we towed. The CTD collected temperature, salinity, oxygen density, and conductivity data within the water column. Our samples were then stored in 10 to 20% ethanol preservative and taken back to the lab to perform taxonomic analysis. In my analysis, I counted and identified each sample using compound light microscopy in order to evaluate the approximate zooplankton abundance and diversity of our station's toes. These samples were subsampled into five milliliter aliquots and volumes were then converted to replicate the sample site's water column. For statistical analysis, I ran a standard t-test for night zooplankton abundance versus day zooplankton abundance to assess significant differences in populations. I then ran separate t-tests on individual species that exhibited large differences in their abundances pertaining to day and nighttime periods. For diversity, a Shannon diversity index was administered to examine the approximate species richness and evenness within this environment. So let's start off with our environmental data first. On average, coastal waters tend to have much more mixing than large basins in the ocean. And due to this, the variability of zooplankton may be affected by the lack of temperature gradients in the specific environment. So in our temperature versus depth graph, the figure six, temperature is going to be on the x-axis in Celsius and depth is going to be on the y-axis in meters. And what we can see is at about 2.5 to 3 meters in, we see a steep decline in temperature, except for, of course, June 19th right here. But in terms of temperature gradients, we don't see any indication that any are present during the day. For figure 7 and 8, depth is once again in meters on the y-axis, and then conductivity is on the x-axis, and down here, salt concentration is on the x-axis. These graphs show that each deployment collected consistent levels of salinity and conductivity within the water column. But again, with the constant mixing of these shallow coastal waters, the evenness within the water column is to be expected. 
In our night samples taken, figure nine displays temperature uh, in Celsius again on the x-axis and depth in meters on the y-axis. And these night samples start off colder on the surface compared to the day samples seen in the previous slides, which had a range of 13.5 to 15 degrees Celsius. And then at the bottom, they seem to be reaching an average around 10 degrees Celsius at the bottom of the water column. However, on June 17th, which is this gray line right here, there seems to be potential for a temperature gradient, but more data would have to be collected to look into this further. Similar to the environmental data for the day samples, both salt, both salt concentration down here on the x-axis and conductivity on the x-axis in figure 10, both having depth in meters on the y-axis once again, they are both consistent within the water column as we saw in the day samples. For the diversity aspect of the study, I ran a Shannon diversity index that estimates an environment's species richness and evenness given the proportion of species in a given sample. In each pie chart, the total amount of zooplankton seen within our samples was broken up into four separate groups, one containing copepod species, the Clodosura group containing Evadne normani and podon, the mollusca group consisting of bivalves and gastropods, and then the others group uh, was gathered together due to their abundances making up a small proportion, about uh, less than 0.1 animals per liter in a given sample, except for barnacle nautili, which also displayed a notable quantity in our samples. But as you can see, both pie charts don't look drastically different and support that each population Shannon diversity index are also very similar. In the day environment, there was a Shannon diversity index value of 2.47 and during the nighttime, it was 2.42. These values fall in line between 1.5 and 3.5, which are typical values seen in ecological studies. It is important to note here, however, that Shan diversity does not distinguish between environmental species richness versus species evenness, and further analysis would be to look into defining these factors to indicate any differences. In our abundance data, we have three graphs. The y-axis show the number of organisms per liter, except for figure 15 and 16, which show average number of individuals per liter. And on the x-axis, we show uh, the groups and species that we were focusing on. So for graph one, the graph illustrates the average number of animals perceived uh, in groups similar to figures two and three on the previous slide for the uh, pie charts. And within the column in both day and night environments. So day average is going to be in light blue and night average is going to be in dark blue. The error bars depicted show how accurate each grouping's mean abundance is likely to be compared to the true population mean within our site's water column. And the t-test administered on day and night abundances had a p-value of 0 0.072, uh, prov proving not to be as statistically supportive of our hypothesis with an alpha margin of 0 0.05. In graph two, we see the average copepod concentration in day and night samples. These copepod species made up the majority of copepods seen within uh, samples, but Akarsha, the first species indicated on here, seemed to have been the only species that exhibited distinct DVM behaviors in day and night abundances. For graph three, these species of zooplankton made up a large portion of what was seen in day and night samples, with the Vadney showing um, a t value of 0 0.09, and then barnacle nautili showing a t value of 0 0.20. These were the species of particular interest due to their overwhelming abundance within each subsample. It turns out that Akarsha was the only animal within the samples that displayed a significant difference between their day and night abundances, proving a t-value of 0.005. Akarsha also exhibited a staggering 238% increase in night abundances. For the other species of interest, barnacle nopuli had a more than twofold increase in abundances at night with a t-value of 0.20 and 130% change in size and a Vadney Normani AT value of 0 0.09 and an 86% increase in night abundances. So what does this all mean? What is the study's implications? And what does further research look like here? Well, in this study, we have determined that zooplankton abundances on average are higher at night compared to during the day. However, our data was not statistically significant under a marginal alpha of 0 0.05. It is projected that the collection of more data would likely find the statistical difference in day and night abundances, though. In regards to species richness and evenness variation within day and night environments, we can also determine that these populations are similar in both respect, given their diversity value, values falling in the 2.4 range or roughly 0.05 values apart from each other. In addition to this, we can conclude that Akarsha Tonsa experienced a significant difference in DVM behavior consistent with day versus night environments, exhibiting a 238% increase in nighttime abundances. 
However, this does not seem to be a predominant influence in all copepod species. Of course, advanced predator evasion skills compared to other copepods could be a consideration in this observed response, but underlying ontogenic traits are also being deliberated at large. Other zooplankton observed, such as Evadne normani and Barnacle Nopoli, also displayed a notable DVM behavior incited by daytime and nighttime periods, both increasing in night abundances by 86% and 130%. Despite these numbers, they do not prove to be statistically significant. However, these numbers alone still speak volumes for their distributional behaviors within this environment. These results have important implications for trophic dynamics and food availability within marine coastal food webs. What type and amount of zooplankton are present at night versus during the day has room to then expand on what type of predators are following or even instigating these patterns seen within shallow feeding grounds. The ability for scientists to pinpoint an all-encompassing influence on these dispersal behaviors continues to be ambiguous, and so further analysis would be to instead investigate species-specific migratory behavior and their impact on the grazing rates in economically important species that rely on these prey during developmental stages. And so I would like to recognize the support and funding from the National Science Foundation for the Bigelow Laboratory RU program, as well as funding also being provided for this project by Sea Grant, which is awarded to DMF. I would also like to give a special thanks to those who supported me and provided their expertise throughout this program, such as Maura Nimesto, Dr. Abigail Tyrell, Dr. Rachel Asley Ratcher, Rasher, and Dr. David Fields. Also, a big shout out to the staff at Bigelow Laboratory for their support during the RU program, especially given the unusual circumstances that we have been thrown into. And with that, I am open to questions. Thank you for your silent applause, everyone. <laughs> Are there any questions from the students? I had a quick question. Um, what about the Akarsha makes it more advanced in their predator evasion tactics? Yeah, so Akarsha have extremely long uh, antennae, and on that antennae is very long setae. And so when they're swimming around and they feel disturbance around their environment, those long setae are incredibly sensitive. And so they are more apt to do this hopping and dodging um, type of evasion, as opposed to a Uri Tamarot finis, which is basically just a free floating uh, copepod and doesn't experience this type of uh, action uh, tactics when there are uh, environmental cues that are you know, telling them that there might be something around. So that uh, is one of the things that might be uh, applicated towards this type of response that we're seeing from them. But again, ontogenetic traits as well as in uh, what their makeup is could also be a factor in their behavior. Thank you for that question. So there's one in the chat box. Uh, how would you expect the results to change if you had sampled at low tide as well? Oh, that's you, Jess. So that's a good question. I think at low tide, perhaps there would be a difference in what we would see in the in. Um, I think the only reason why we only did at high tide was so we didn't have an influx of animals coming in as we were sampling. We wanted to kind of have the lowest burial as possible. But I guess I would have to look more into uh, the low tides and what kind of environmental factors are affecting that more in terms of it. But as we saw during um, the samples that I provided, the environmental samples really didn't show a difference or any type of uh, distinction on what their behavior, what the behaviors at the copepods were responding to. So that's interesting to think about. We have one more minute. David. <laughs> uh, did you ever see any fish larvae or predators um, of these smaller crustaceans come up in your samples? I did actually. The first uh, sample that we did actually we had four uh, lobster larvae that were in our toe. So that was very weird. Uh, I also saw somewhat of an abundance of fish larvae within my samples in their, uh, in their egg where you could see the larval in there. Um, so that has implications for the predators that are in the same column that we are seeing in uh, our copepod abundances. Perfect. So Molly was the only one that actually got to sample, to yeah. actually come and do the samples. And she was a trooper because she sampled sometimes at 11 or even midnight to catch the nighttime here in Maine. 
So it was, was definitely worth it though. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. And Annabelle. All right. Thank you everyone for being here. I know it's a, it's hard to be the last, but well, thanks to everyone for staying with us. So, uh, hi, my name is Annabelle adams BA, and this summer I worked under Dr. Booker, Dr. Brown, and Dr. Arcut to investigate the DNA of candidate phylum OP collected from crustal fluid. By studying the DNA of this bacteria, we're trying to learn more about what this bacteria is doing to survive in the ocean crust. So the ocean crust is the subsurface of the ocean and it is this big layer of rock that is porous. So since it's porous, seawater can enter through the crust, circulate through, and then be expelled through hydrothermal vents or small pores in the ocean crust. So as the seawater circulates through, these seawater rock interactions provide nutrients for microorganisms that live in this environment. One of the ways that we can study this environment are through corks. So you can think of a cork like a well drilled in the bottom of the ocean in the crust um, that allows us access to crustal fluid and any microbes that might be living in this environment. So way before I got to Bigelow in 2011 and 2019, there were two research cruises that went off the coast of Washington to the Juan de Fuca plate to the star here, which is where a well is drilled in the ocean crust. There, a robot named Jason went down to the cork, collected crustal fluid, where it then brought it back up to the research crews where scientists awaited the samples, and then they were brought back to Bigelow. At Bigelow, cell sorting was conducted using flow cytometry, so this is a way to um, sort cells from non-cells and identify the individual cells. Those individual cells were then sequenced using single cell genomics, um, which gave us the genomes, which were then annotated. So with those annotated genomes, with that genetic information, we then looked for the conserved 16S ribosomal RNA gene. And now this gene is present in all bacteria. So it's a way that, it's a way that we can identify when a cell is a bacterium and what type of bacteria that cell is. So after this analysis that happened way before I got to Bigelow, candidate phylum OP was found in these crustal fluid samples. So now who is candidate phylum OP8? Candidate phylum OP8 has been found in many diverse environments, but it has never been cultured, which means that everything we know about it is through genomics. So what we were excited to find it in the crustal fluid to try and gain a better understanding of what this phylum is doing in the ocean crust. So I wanna pause for a second and emphasize that the phylum level is a very broad level of classification these three organisms, a sea squirt, tiger, and shark, are all within the phylum level, even though we know that they're very different from each other. So because of that, and because of the vast diversity among the phylum level, OP8 in different environments show different metabolisms. So in some environments, autotrophic metabolisms were found, which means that the OP8 was using inorganic carbon, or for example, carbon gases in the environment as their carbon source, as opposed to heterotrophic metabolisms, which have also been found, which just means organic carbon is used as the carbon source, which is, which is carbon from living um, organisms. So since there's this very variability in carbon utilization within the OP8 phylum, our hypothesis was that OP8 genomes from crustal fluid will show genomic potential for autotrophic modes of metabolism because of the nutrient poor environment in the ocean crust. Now, before we get into metabolisms, we wanted to do a phylogenetic comparison using that 16S ribosomal RNA gene that we spoke about earlier. So we had two questions. The first was, how do the crustal fluid OP8 bacteria relate to each other? And how do the crustal fluid OP8 bacteria relate to other environmental OP8s? And we do this by comparing that 16S gene. Now, over here, we have a phylogenetic tree. And just to walk you through how we read these trees, where the branches come together, this is called a node and it represents a common ancestor. So by looking at this tree, you can tell that the blue and red bacteria are going to be more similar than the red and yellow bacteria because the red and yellows back, uh, the red and yellows most common or most recent shared ancestor is back here. So going into what our um, phylogenetic trees looked like, this was our first tree with just the crustal fluid OP8 genomes. 
and we saw some interesting things. So we saw two major clades, so two major groupings. The large clade had a lot of diversity within it, whereas the small clade all seemed very similar to each other. And now with, uh, with this data that we, that we analyzed, we wanted to add it to already published information on OP8. So what you're looking at here is a already published tree from 2014. All the black groupings here are cells that were published in the 2014 paper. And this paper actually broke the phylum down into class and order. So here you can see the class, OP81, unclassified three and two, and then OP81 was actually broken down into orders. And what's interesting is that we see our small clade clading within this HMMV order, whereas our large clade actually cladded alone, indicating that it might be a new class of OP8s. So we then wanted to expand upon that tree and use all publicly available data from now or from about five weeks ago. And we saw similar things. So we see that this clade here still is clading by itself and our small clade is still clading within this order. And we also saw that there was some grouping by environment. So it seems like some of the OP8s might be influenced um, in this tree by the environment, but some of them also didn't group exactly with environment. So following our phylogenetic analysis, we wanted to investigate the genome to see what type of metabolism this bacteria might be doing. And we used the whole genome for this. But the caveat of using the whole genome is that through sequencing, we don't get 100% of the genome in this case, we got between 12 and 58% of the genome, which means that when we look for genomic evidence of heterotrophy and autotrophy, we can only determine presence, we can't determine absence. And again, our hypothesis was that the crustal fluid genomes will show autotrophic potential because of the nutrient-poor environment. And now this prompted a second question, which was, are the two crustal fluid opiate clades different because of their respective carbon metabolism? So is this the reason that they are clading differently in the tree? And so what we did to try and answer these questions was we made a genome cartoon. So I know it might be a little overwhelming, but the black arrows represent genes that were present in both clades. The dotted arrow represents absence in both clades. Orange means present in large clade and blue is present in only the small clade. So now I'm going to talk about some of the carbon metabolisms that we found. We looked to see how organic carbon could enter the crustal fluid um, OP8 genomes. And we found evidence that carbon substrates can be imported into the cell, which is strong evidence for heterotrophy. We then wanted to see how that organic carbon could be used. And we found pretty strong evidence for glycolysis, the non-oxidative pentose phosphate pathway, and the TCA cycle all indicating that this bacteria relies on heterotrophic modes of metabolism. But we also looked to see if there were autotrophic pathways um, in, this, in these genomes. And what we found was half of the woodlong doll pathway, which, is what, which was going to be our indicator of autotrophy. And now because we only found half of the pathway, there seems to be more evidence suggesting heterotrophy, but this is certainly something to consider. Now, moving away from carbon, we also looked at the electron transport chain, which is one way that bacteria can get energy. So in both clades, it seems as though the electron transport chain begins at NADH oxyoreductase, and then there are different possible endpoints within the different clades. But it was very cool to be able to find a full electron transport chain in these clades. So for our carbon metabolisms, our hypothesis was that we expected autotrophic modes, and we did not find that. We found stronger evidence for heterotrophic metabolisms, meaning that this bacteria might be using organic carbon. And now both clades showed similar heterotrophic pathways, which means that the carbon metabolisms are probably not the reason that these clades are different. For our future directions, we're hoping, we're hoping to investigate other gene variations that could cause these differences between the clades, as well as investigating other metabolisms that we didn't get to um, in the span of this 10-week project. We'd also like to explore differences within the whole OP8 phyla to try and understand why our crustal fluid OP8 separate themselves from other environmental OP8 cells. 
Now with that, I would like to say a huge thank you to the Rodney L. White Fellowship, NASA, and NSF for their funding of this project. I'd also like to say thank you to Dr. Ann Booker, Dr. Julia Brown, and Dr. Beth Cook for their mentorship, um, as well as the ORCUT Lab attendees for listening to this presentation many times. Um, David Fields, Nicole Poulton, Roxana Branch, everyone who participated in the Hour of Codes and the Bigelow seminars and all the other amazing Bigelow staff that we got to come in contact with virtually this summer. So thank you to everyone at Bigelow. And I'd also like to thank my mentors at the New School for all of their help, um, as well as my family for their continued support over these 20 years. <laughs> so with that, I would like to take any questions and thank you all for uh, being here and participating. So I have a question. Uh, I'm wondering why you looked for the, I'm going to botch this, but wood loop ball ha <laughs> pathway. <laughs> and if you looked at any other autotrophic pathways. Yeah, so um, we looked at the wood long doll pathway because other autotrophic opiates um, had been shown to have potential for this pathway. So we thought it was a good place to start. And then also other microbes in the ocean crust environment um, have been shown to have the, have the potential to use a wood lung doll pathway. Um, but we did look at other autotrophic metabolisms such as the reverse TCA cycle and some others. Um, actually, when we were doing our metabolic analyses, we uploaded our genomes into KEG. Um, which allows you to visualize what's happening in the um, genomes and going through the autotrophic metabolisms that they have listed there, we didn't see any strong evidence. Um, so that's, that's why there's overwhelming evidence for heterotrophy, but it, it's a good question because we did look at more than just the wood long doll pathway. All right, thank you. Of course. Um, can I ask a question? I'm wondering, you talked about the quarks at the beginning. I'm wondering like how many of those there are in the ocean yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good question. So I don't know exactly how many there are in the ocean, but there are two like sampling locate two study sites. One of which is on the Juan de Fuca plate, which is what I spoke about, and then one is in the Atlantic Ocean. And then I think that there's another one. Um, I believe there's another one off the coast of New Zealand, um, but I don't think any microbiology work has been conducted there yet. Any other ones out there? Well, I got one. <laughs> yes, David. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, you look at heterotrophy and autotrophy as, as the dividing factor, and that's kind of a, a big cut. But within the heterotrophy or within the autotrophy, what other, what other kind of pathways do you end up looking for? I mean, I guess you could look for specific autotrophy type of pathways. Um, but are there other kinds of deeper cuts that are, are typical for dividing out bacterial cells into different clades? So I think I get what you're asking. Um, and, I, so, and I think part of that is in like the future directions of our study. So something that we wanna look into are CRISPR sequences, cause those can, um, those can impact like the evolution of different bacteria. So we, we looked for heterotrophic and autotrophic metabolisms, but there's so much more that we can look for in the cells to try and see what is making these difference. One of these is the, one of these could be CRISPR sequences. There are a lot of other things that we can look for. Um, did that answer your question? It did. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted you to be able to develop that a little bit. If, oh, okay. If, <laughs> if you had something, if you had something sitting. Um, that is it. That brings to close kind of this first half of the symposium. Um, tomorrow, we're going to start again at one o'clock. I'll give the same brief introduction if there are other people coming in. So don't be old, don't be thinking that you're uh, in Groundhog Day there. Um, and if the students would stay on, then I'm saying goodbye to everybody else. <laughs> and we'll see you tomorrow at one o'clock at the same time for the second half of all of this stuff. And I'd like to just give a round of applause to all of you guys that presented today. It was just fantastic. I mean, you're not going to hear anybody else but me, but I'm sure I represent the other 55 or 70 people.